everyone. Um, welcome to the 2023 annual e-twinning national conference. Um, my name is Una Kehali. Um, I'm one of the e-twinning officers at Lergus. Um, we're delighted to welcome you here today. Um, thank you to everyone who's come in person to join us here in the Gibson Hotel. Um, and thank you very much to everyone who's joining us on the online stream, which is on the Hop In platform this morning. Um, we hope that you have um, an engaging conference experience. Um, so I'm just going to quickly run through the agenda for today. Um, so we're starting now at 10 o'clock. Um, after I speak, we'll have a welcome from the Lergus Executive Director, Lorraine Gilligan. Um, and then we'll have our keynote address, which is um, from Professor Deirdre Butler um, from the DCU School of Education on our theme of innovation and education. Um, after Deirdre, we'll have a video address from our MEP, Maria Walsh. Um, following that, we'll have a panel discussion on digital well-being, which is moderated by Fiona Foreman. And um, we have a slight change in the agenda here, so Fiona Collins will not be joining us. Um, and on our paper agendas, um, Jane McGarrigal is replacing uh, Tracy Hogan from Webwise. Um, after the panel, there will be time for a Q&A from the audience. Um, and then we'll have our uh, award ceremony. So we're celebrating the National Quality Label winners, and also our European uh, Innovative Teaching Award winners. Um, and that will be followed by a coffee break. Um, our workshops then will begin at 12 o'clock. So those are in separate rooms. So the AI and Education workshop is upstairs in um, the Cordoba suite. That's facilitated by Shannon Ahern. And then we'll have our Creativity and Education workshop, which will be facilitated by Maria O'Donovan and Breed Grady. That's in um, a room on this floor called the Stratocaster C but we'll be there to direct you um, to find your rooms later on. We'll also have a third workshop for our online participants. Um, so that is Erasmus Plus Opportunities, and that's with Carol Ann York and Ronan O'Sullivan. Um, after the workshops, we will have lunch in the Coda restaurant, which is just outside here. Um, so we'd be delighted if you would join us for that at one o'clock. Um, and yeah, you can follow us on social media. Um, so if you want to post any photos or tweet throughout the day, you can use the hashtag eTwinning so that we can see it and share it. Um, and you'll find us with those um, handles on uh, Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, and finally, we'll be sending around a survey next week um, just to gauge everyone's feedback on the event. Um, so keep an eye out for that. We'd love to hear from you. Um, so I'll hand over now to Lorraine to kick us off. I think that's for you, Una, that round of applause. Um, good morning, everybody. It's really nice to be here on a sunny Saturday morning in the Gibson Hotel, which uh, is the first dates hotel, if anybody watches television like I do and had that moment coming up the elevator. Um, I also want to welcome our online viewers and guests today. Thanks very much for maybe staying in your pyjamas with a cup of coffee this morning and enjoying what we're going to offer you in terms of inspiration um, and a little bit of a celebration as well. We'll have some awards today. Uh, but before I go any further, and because I will probably forget, I do want to say thank you so much to the eTwinning team here in Lurgis, Una and Ava, who've really worked so hard to put together the agenda for you and to make this a really inspiring experience for each day. And I think you're really going to enjoy it. So I will invite you to give us a little clap online or to give us a clap in the room for the colleagues, Una and Ava. And thank you. So as I mentioned today, we're here to look at a celebration for the e-twinning community. And I think that community, uh, from my perspective as the director in Lurgis, is a community that really represents commitment and quality and innovation. And that's all I ever hear of coming through from e-twinning and projects. So I think it's lovely to be able to gather today and to be able to celebrate that spirit that you bring to your work and the spirit that you bring to the e-twinning communities here in Ireland and in Europe. So I'll invite you to give yourselves a short round of applause for that. So we have over 2,000 teachers here in Ireland who are registered onto the eTwinning platform, which I think is brilliant, and over a million eTwinning members across the platform at a European level. Um, and we do have eTwinning ambassadors here today, but you're all, all 2,000 members, all 1 million members are ambassadors for eTwinning. So one of the things that we always try to do is 
give you the, the gift or they give you the, the, the call to action to make sure that you share um, your, your experience of e-twinning with your colleagues whenever you can. If there's anything we can do to help you to do that, please do let us know. But, you know, share the love a little bit whenever you get the chance today and into the future and back in your schools when you go back home. Uh, today, 2023 conference, um, the themes that we're looking at are innovation in education. Uh, we're recognising the innovation that exists here already in Ireland. Uh, the themes that we're addressing will be via the keynote from our guest speaker, Professor Deirdre Butler, on innovation in digital learning and teachers' professional development and her work on the digital strategy for schools, which I think you'll find really, really interesting and really inspiring and really relevant, I think, for, for the world that we live in today. We have the workshops on AI in education and creativity and education and Erasmus Plus opportunities for teachers. So I was talking to some people outside at registration and eTwinning is one of the initiatives that we offer that doesn't support, you know, doesn't require a funding stream to it. But many of you will also be involved in Erasmus Plus and those of you who aren't, we're hoping to be able to help you make that connection today so that you might be by the time we have our 2024 conference and we'll be having another conversation with you. Um, we also want to take some time today to recognise winners of uh, the different quality labels. The e we have nine winners for the eTwin and quality label here in 2023. So we're going to acknowledge you in the room and celebrate you and your achievements in, in attaining that quality label. And what's wonderful is um, there's a European competition for education and innovation. And we have three winners here today online and in the room that we're going to be making awards to as well. So uh, without any further ado, I'm going to let us get on with the rest of the programme. I'm going to invite Deirdre up to give you her very interesting keynote and hope you enjoy your day. Again, thanks to the team and have a brilliant day in the Gibson Hotel in Dublin on a sunny Saturday afternoon. All right. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, and uh, as an ex-primary school teacher myself, I'm delighted with the work that uh, eTwinning does. Um, uh, it's have to, to have those opportunities to reach out and work with others is really, really essential because it really helps what widen your perspective and actually get you to communicate with other people and see other people's perspectives. So well done to the project and I hope to hear more about it. Okay. Um, today, what I'm trying to do is, now it's going to be very difficult difficult for me because I have to stand in one place. Those of you who know me know that I'm a wanderer, okay? Um, so uh, we'll see do I manage it for a whole 30 minutes. Um, today, and this is what I really believe, and it's really a testament to teachers as well, I really believe that education is the most powerful weapon that we can use to change the world. I don't think we can underestimate the power of it. And Nelson Mandela was somebody that I was really sort of would look up to. I was delighted to be able to visit Robben Island and actually sort of feel the spirit of the man. And he really believed this is the way to change the world. And I think you can too. What we really have to be aware of though is that the world has changed. These were the skills that are in decline over the last number of years. Um, these things like non-routine manual, non-routine uh, analytic, etc. These are the skills that are in decline. This work was done 20 years ago. We were aware of it then. The skills that are in demand are critical thinking and complex communication. So we have to decide, like, how are we actually preparing our students of today to actually meet those demands that are out there? Over the last 20 years, they've actually increased. So if you look at this graph, you see the gap is widening all the time. This research is done by Levy and Murnane, and you're looking at sort of, you know, working with complex problems, thinking in innovative ways. So how do we do that? And if you look at then the top 10 skills that are required in 2015, 2020, you'll see there on top, it's complex problem solving, critical thinking, um, you know, sort of communicating with others, project management. And if you think that's gone away, they're not, okay? They're actually becoming more and more important. So actually engaging in e-twinning is actually developing a lot of these skills so now we have to say, well, how do we do this in innovative and imaginative ways? So how do we build our curriculum in such a way that we're hitting these because these are the skills that are in demand, not only for people to actually live and thrive in the complex world, but actually when you talk about well-being later on, I think that you, in this digital age, we need to be aware of these things too. So in order to be a rounded individual, we need to have these skills to actually live and thrive in the world today. To try and capture, like sort of, the, the to, to imagine what the type of world is, this is a really good video I want you to actually look at. Have a look at the different things and it just captures in a very two minutes. And it's a video that's done by the Strategic Alliance and the World Economic Forum. 
that gives a picture of the world we live in today and how do we actually prepare people to live in this world. How are artificial intelligence, migration and education connected? How can boosting innovation, reducing inequality and combating corruption help us to achieve the sustainable development goals? In an increasingly complex world, these connections can be hard to see. Yet a systemic understanding of global issues is essential. The World Economic Forum developed strategic intelligence as a set of cutting-edge digital tools to explore, understand, and anticipate the forces driving transformations around the world. At its heart are the Forum's transformation maps. They depict and analyze the interdependencies between a wide range of topics, illustrating how developments in one area can impact others. By drawing on the collective intelligence of the Forum's networks, Transformation maps explain the factors driving change across industries, economies, and global issues. For example, by disrupting every aspect of technology, the fourth industrial revolution will have a profound impact on governance and affect the scale and character of conflict. That will test the traditional role of governments, even as they confront other challenges such as the aging populations in advanced economies. Transformation maps cover more than 200 topics and are available in multiple languages. Each topic is defined by its key issues, the most strategic trends shaping that topic. Because we are not looking at topics in isolation, but instead at entire systems in transformation, we highlight how the issues depicted in one map are interdependent with other maps. The content is continuously updated by leading experts from the forum's extensive network. It is supplemented by a machine-curated feed of the latest findings and analysis from top universities and research institutions, and is enhanced by technologies used in machine learning, artificial intelligence, and advanced network analytics. The platform also incorporates economic, social, and political data, as well as time-lapse satellite imagery, allowing you to visualize trends in areas such as sea level rise, deforestation, global trade flows, and the refugee crisis. Strategic Intelligence is the World Economic Forum's most advanced knowledge resource you can use to navigate today's increasingly complex and interconnected world. So as you saw there, I think it actually summarizes the world we live in. It's very complex. What's even interesting is the fact you talked about sort of the interdependencies. And in order to appreciate the interdependencies, we need to get to know people. We need to get to understand the world we live in and realize that everything is not in isolation. And I think that's the power of even this e-twinning and the fact that you get to know one another across Europe. But you need to understand as well, I think, the problems we live in. How do we, and I think it really summed it up there, we have these economic issues, we have these migration issues, we have employment issues, we have war issues. And how do we pe like prepare people to live in this world that we can actually capture it, that we can be in control of it. And if the world is changing, it's changing really rapidly. If you look at that diagram here from 1990, the last 30 years, it actually captures like we were connecting, then we had tools that enabled us to engage. Now they're using the word like transform, but who's in charge of the transformation? Okay, we have to decide who's in charge of it and how do we take control of it and how do we enable and empower our students to take control of it. And on top of that, then we have this sort of, you know, many of you will recognize the symbol because it actually took the world by storm this time last year, chat GTP. I mean, it was the one time I actually saw it, so the university, the university went to meltdown. I was delighted, <laughs> do you know what I mean? I was absolutely thrilled because I said, for the first time ever now, they're actually going to really look at assessment, do you know what I mean? And actually think, you know, because I've been always telling my students, I really don't need what you send, need to sort of write for me. So I actually focus on like so workshops and doing things and everything else. This was terrific. To me, I said, hallelujah. And I think it's great because you really have to say, well, if a machine can chug out what we've asked people to do, how do we actually engage people to do things very differently to actually humanize and actually leverage the power of what we're doing? So it really shook the world up. So it's a real watershed moment. And we have to make sure that it is a watershed that we will change, that it actually won't be a quagmire and that it actually will enable us to be more human and that it won't go the other way. So I think we really need to grasp this moment in time. This was issued a number of years ago and I remember when it came out as well, people sort of were up in arms about it. But I think 
what's really important is that we need to understand that this. If they aren't able to understand the complex digital landscape we live in, they're no longer able to participate fully in the economic, cultural and social life that people are around them. So we need to grasp the nettle. We can't keep ignoring it. So we need to say, well, what do we do? And as teachers and educators, we have a huge responsibility and fantastic moral imperative to make sure that the people we interact with are capable of changing and shaping the world in the future. When I qualified as a teacher, I remember my grandmother gave me a plaque and it said, to teach is to touch a life forever. And I don't think we understand that. So as a primary school teacher over your lifetime, you'll have a minimum interaction, minimum, if you have 20 children over 40 years, 800 children. That's just directly. Never mind all the other children you have reach out to. And a post-primary, it's five times more because you have at least five different groups you know, over the school year. So we have a huge place in society and we need to realise how we actually can reach out and make sure we, we, we change the world the way we need to change it. We've been tackling this job of digital technology for a long time. Um, we were only talking earlier, and I'm saying, yeah, I'm doing this sort of for decades. Um, and I use this like Fihibli and Eggfoss, like 20 years growing, because our first digital strategy, and it's more now, was in 1997. And since then, we've had a number of them. We had been leading. We're very good at policy, OK? What we need to do now is actually really implement it. So these are the policies we've had over time. So we have been ahead of the posse in the digital strategy in 2015. You know, if you watch the language, you know, we were talking about the vision was ICT integration, but we were talking about being able to enhance teaching, learning and assessment so that young people can become engaged thinkers, active learners, knowledge constructors and global citizens. OK, so that we were aware of what needed to be done. Uh, and we try to actually develop a digital learning framework for, to enable people to think about how you do this. Um, unfortunately, only a couple of years into it, when we were really getting our feet under the table, COVID-19 happened. Now, it had its positives in the fact that, you know, we were able to, people were, had to, they were thrown into it to actually engage with the use of digital technologies during the, especially the two periods of school lockdown and over the time of the pandemic. And there was an increase in collegiality and in teamwork. Um, people, they, they, they did get engaged in professional learning, et cetera. But a lot of people felt uncomfortable as well because it was a challenge for people who hadn't engaged. However, a lot of people began to think that sort of online was the only way to do things. And they also thought that this was what digital learning was when it wasn't. It was actually a sort of a, an emergency remote response. And being digital in education and being digital in learning means an awful lot more. So we have to really think, OK, and this is a phrase I coined up, and I think of ACDC, but it's actually showing my age now. But it's what we're trying to, I was trying to capture is, rather than throw the baby out with the bathwater, we have to actually think of sort of, you know, what happened during COVID? But what happened before COVID? And what are we now going to do after COVID, post-COVID? What are we going to do? How are we going to actually merge what we've learned? And what does this digital innovation and education really mean? You know, what do we mean by innovation? What does innovation look like? It's different in different contexts. Uh, what, does it, what does this mean for education? Like, what does innovation and education mean? And then a lot of the time, yeah, we're very confused, perplexed, sort of bewildered at this stage, like what exactly is, is being asked for. And then we're talking about what do we mean by digital innovation? So I think it's questions we really need to try and sort of answer. What do we mean by any of and all of these terms when we actually combine them? And they're all influenced by our values, beliefs, and experiences. I love these ads. You'll see them in HSBC, do you know what I mean? The bank ads, you'll see them around the airports. They're really, really innovative, whoever does their sort of um, communication program. It's the same thing, but when we look at it, depending on our experiences, it means different things. So that was the one thing we have to take on board is the fact that what I think about something and you think about something is very different. And we actually, again, need to be able to communicate and talk to one another in order to be able to understand what are our values, beliefs and assumptions and what do we mean when we say digital? What do we mean when we say innovation? And how do we actually then talk about digital education and innovation? What do we mean by it? What does it look like? So as we try and look at education and reimagine it, we have to think of design for learning. How do we design for learning? One thing that cracks me up is language like sort of lesson, sort of planning. 
you know. Um, I prefer to think of it as designing for learning. So we are learning designers. Um, so how do we actually design learning in such a way that it actually will reach all our learners and empower all our learners? And how can we do it in a way that's co-construction that we're working with our learners? And how do we use the technologies as tools and objects to think with so that we are in control? The Digital Education Action Plan was a great move. Um, we actually, and if you look at the language, it's sort of resetting education and training in the digital age. So how do we reset education? Um, and that influenced a lot the work of our own digital um, strategy, which was launched then in 2022. And it was looking at education to 2027. Look at the language and how the language has moved on from 2015. We're talking about empowering schools to harness the opportunities of digital transformation to build digital competence and an effective digital education sort of uh, environment and ecosystem so that we can actually develop people who are competent, critical, engaged, active learners while supporting them to reach their potential and participate as global citizens in a digital world. Okay. Now, if you were to unpack that, and I think that even as a starting point for people to actually just look at that stated vision and try and unpack it, what does it mean? What does it mean in your context? What does it mean in the context of the schools you are actually working with? And does it look different? And how do you actually build understanding together? And I think even that would be a fantastic um, sort of starting point for people. However, we really need to, when we look at that vision, the tendency is to actually look at um, the what, okay? People usually start with the what question and they generally sort of say, well, what devices are we going to use? Because they all get, like, they get all sort of hung up on the, the grits, the tools, the things we can, the toys we can play with, or the software. What about the software? What are we going to use? You know, and then we have issues like copyright, okay? We have issues like online safety. We have issues like sort of the whole thing of Facebook, which is now meta. You know, it's always changing. So, and then they might say, well, how are we going to do it? Is it going to be sort of, um, sort of the cloud? Is it going to be sort of networking? Is it, what are we going to do? Um, how are we going to do it? Uh, are we going to have routers? Like, what, what's, what's, what, uh, so it's all the how. So it's all focused on the technical stuff, okay? The toys and the tech. Whereas maybe then they might get to the why question. Why are we doing it in the first place? Why do we need to engage with these sort of tools? When really the only thing we're guaranteed is constant change. So we need to actually ask the why question. Like, why do we have to engage with this? Well, the world is changing. We have AI, we have AR, we have VR, we have robotics. And the only thing we don't know is the fact that the world is going to keep changing. So how do we prepare people to live in this type of world? So maybe we need to think of the why question first. And then maybe when we've sorted that out, we actually might, might look at the what, because that's going to influence what we do. And then how are we going to do it? Okay, so for me, I always think we should start with the why, then go on the what, then go on the how. On the how. So why, in this world of that's constantly changing, what's the imperative? Why do we need to do this? And to answer that question, I think the what, instead of being what are the tools we need to look at, we need to be asking the what questions of what kind of future do we want to create? What kind of people do we want to nurture? And what values do we want to live by? So I think they're the what questions. And then the how becomes, of course, all of those questions are going to be influenced by our values, beliefs, and assumptions. And then it's going to be the how. How are we going to do it? The world is in our hands, and how are we going to shape that world for these people that we're actually interacting with? It's going to be confusing. It's going to be bewildering. We're actually going to go off in all different types of directions. But if we do it together, at least we can help one another and support one another to do that. People sometimes ask the question, okay, what digital technologies? Oh, they're just another tool. And they won't fundamentally change what we do. That's the answer sometimes, or the question, and the response that I sometimes get. And I'd say, hang on. You know, the technologies that we actually interact with, they don't have an independent existence of their own. 
and they can't be considered in isolation. It's how you interpret them and what you do with them and the values, beliefs and assumptions you bring to the tools. That's what determines what happens and what they do. Because implicit in this sort of the, 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 the sort of the understanding is then and the nature of knowing and the values that we are that we hold, they're all and I deliberately use the Celtic knot because it's there's no beginning and no ending. Everything is influencing the other thing. So we need to really think about what you understand, the nature of knowing and the technologies and how they're valued. Jerome Bruner, I'm sure, sure some of you have a distant memory of him at some stage in your sort of education career. And he, th he taught about that thinking is the internaliz internalization of the tools provided by a given culture, okay? And Vygotsky, if you sort of think about it again, he was the, really importantly, it was the changes in the tools bring about changes in thinking. And these changes in, ch in turn then are associated with changes in culture. So they're all interacting with one another. So the tools we use change our thinking, our thinking in turn change the tools, and they're all enmeshed. So we need to be very much in, in control and in charge and understand the tools we use. So it's really, really important that we actually use these and together understand what they can do. And we need to, and this is Mar uh, Minsky talked about sort of suitcase words, and I really think it's, it's th something to take on, on board, because everybody has a different meaning. Even think of deep learning, for example. So deep learning, I have one understanding of deep learning because I'm from an education background. But if you talk to a computer scientist, they have a very deep, different understanding of deep learning because that's to do with sort of, you know, um, neural networks and everything else. So every field has words that we need to be able to actually unpack and look at the different meanings people have for them. And just because I say digital technologies, doesn't mean that you have the same understanding of it either. Or if I say I'm using such and such in school and this is how I do it, and curriculum, I remember being amazed at the word curriculum. I had one understanding, my Irish understanding of curriculum. When I went to the US first, they had a completely different, and I, it took me ages to work out what was going on because they have a very narrow definition of what it is. So when we think of innovation, is it learning spaces? Is it learning design? Is it your pedagogical approaches? Is it assessment? Is it formal, informal, non-formal? Is it lifelong? So we need to actually, you need to talk about these things. It's not just about the tools, it's also about all of these. Your learning spaces, your learning design, your form of assessment. They need to be considered. And we do have to think about, okay, where are we going to go from here? What, what do we need to do? There is a big chasm, generally between policy and practice. And I'll leave research over there as well. Okay, so we need to actually try and understand like sort of how do we merge people? How do we actually join the dots? Well, you're the key people, okay? Because you're, in the, you're, in the, you're involved in classroom practice. So you need to be able to be aware of policy and be updated with you know, current research. What is the, the next thing in the field? And then support it with things that are going on. We're very good at policy. We've aligned a lot of the policies, but Digital technologies, as I said before, are not necessarily a driver or a catalyst for change. And just because you have in, introduced digital technologies doesn't mean you're gonna, that things are going to happen. You know, it's up to you. You're the people. We did have frameworks to help people understand. So there were things like the self-assessment for school, the, the school self-evaluation plans, digital learning planning guidelines, and the uh, digital learning framework. So we do have guidelines. We do have objects to think with. We do have fantastic resources like the digital learning framework. And we have these sort of, you know, standards from the digital learning framework that, and there are videos there to help people. That what does this look like in practice? But you need to actually then think about it. If you look at the digital learning planning cycle, it's a good way to start to try and identify, well, what are we doing well? How do we actually sort of move to the next space? Um, can we write up our priorities? How do we know if we're doing well? And this is actually a good way to, to start and an inquiry, it's the inquiry process really. So how do you do it? Well, maybe we can start with this in the fact that the key competencies, let's say a primary, now it's been, it's no longer the draft primary curriculum, it's now the primary curriculum framework. And you see the key competencies that have to be developed in line with the curriculum areas and subjects. And you see up there, large and central as well as being a digital learner, being well, 
being able to communicate. We need to develop all these skills. Can you see now where the connection is back to the other sort of documentation? And if you look at the video and the skills that were needed, these are all the skills that are needed for the future. So we have them embedded in the things. We did some um, research and background work for the strategy in the baseline report. And what we found out as well is the fact that a lot of teachers were at the knowledge acquisition stage using the, the UNESCO framework. And some had gone into the knowledge deepening stage. But how can we actually enable ourselves to move forward even further? Okay. What was worrying was the fact that 45% of primary schools and 38 of post-primary schools, digital technologies were not a feature of teaching, learning, and assessment. Okay. And the the schools, they didn't know what digital learning framework, on the digital learning framework, what domain or strategy they were focusing on. They didn't understand and were unaware of the resources for Skullnet, WebWise. They didn't know how to source professional learning. And they were needed help in it for things like procurement. The emerging sticking points, and I think this is where it's really useful, I think it's being involved in e-twinning and we can actually say, well, where do we go from here? Some of the sticking points that were actually sort of highlighted were things like lack of understanding of what actually looks, what is effective practice. Lots of people are using informal approaches to assessment. Um, there was lack of procedures for reporting on the school digital learning plan. And there was a lack of awareness and underutilization of the resources. So being aware of that, I think there are three key things, and I think this is where e-twinning can be really, really helpful. Leadership is required. Things like professional learning is required. But really importantly, I think the recognition of the key role of the agentic teacher. And if we look at professional learning, there's things like sort of, we need a robust and culturally relevant models of professional learning. The whole context of e-twinning can actually provide a lot of that professional learning. School leaders as well need to have coherent, they need to be coherent and flexible and sustainable. That's sort of the leadership. They need to be supported. And I think there is a support network within this group. Focus, and this is really important, and I think a lot of the projects that I've seen as well focus on student-centered pedagogies. I think people are using those. We need interdisciplinary approaches. A lot of the projects you engage with do this. And real-world problem solving. A lot of the projects you do focus on that too meaningful student-teacher connections using a range of digital technologies, and then support within a learning culture that encourages educators to work with one another critically and purposely using a range of technologies for teaching and learning. E-twinning in context, I think, solves and answers a lot of those issues. And I think if we focus on those, I think we'll move the professional learning forward. Leadership is something that is really, really important. Uh, effective school leadership because it needs to be in place for another for staff to be given the room to be able to do this. School leaders need to be supported and then school leaders need to be encouraged to engage in regular help, set up sessions. So perhaps there is a room in e-twinning to actually maybe support school leaders. How do you do that in order to help them support their staff? And one of the key things at the moment maybe that school leaders and teachers could actually engage with is one of these documents and it could actually start conversations like the ethical guidelines on the use of AI and data in teaching and learning for educators. It was launched this time last year by the EU. It's a great starting point. There's lots of questions in it. There's lots of um, guidance on things you can actually look at, talk about. And then there's lots of resources as well. So this is something that maybe could be supported maybe in a leadership forum too. And then to you as the key role of the agentic teacher, we need to have understanding of what digital technology can be, what's important, what learning experiences you know, can be designed to effectively use these technologies well. How do we actually invest in substantial efforts and resources in creating and co-creating with teachers, you know, a range of resources. And I think this is something that you do well. And then thoughtful consideration of professional learning opportunities for teacher is something you do well as well in e-twinning. And it requires changing the beliefs about how technologies are used. Perhaps you can support conversations in this way. And just some resources that may help are things that we have done in the past that I've been involved in. There is the Weave project. So we thought about culturally 
responsive computational thinking. It's now part of the curriculum of primary school. It's also at second level as well. How do we actually support the development of computational thinking that's culturally relevant? There are teacher resources here. There's a handbook. There's lots of things, and it's all available free to yourselves and open. There's also a project I'm involved with at the moment, Artificial Intelligence Forum by Teachers. Um, there's a MOOC. There's a teacher handbook. There's lots of resources. And there's a conference in January, which everybody is, is invited to attend. Um, so I think this is something that could be followed up as well. And maybe there are some projects that people could actually then develop from these resources. And then this is Enrica. This is uh, my PhD student who just qualified and just got her degree there a couple of weeks ago. She actually developed the key ideas of AI for primary schools, just in case you thought it was just for post-primary. She actually developed a range of resources, teacher handbook, and a full website as well. And everything is free to schools, so you can access it there as well. And I think if we do this well, we can change the dots. We can join them. We can be in control. We need to understand that what is core is to enable people to understand and have an impact in the world. And I think this is where we need to actually really step up to the plate as teachers. Um, we do need support, so that's why people in the e-twinning are really, really important because they do support teachers and they do support to have, to have these conversations that are necessary. But remember, you must be the change you want to see in the world. Nobody's going to do it for you. You have to do it. And just one person can have a huge effect. So don't think, oh, it's only me. I can actually only do it. If one person does it, but you have the support of a full network here. So you can imagine the power you have, not only in Ireland, but across Europe. So you can do it together. And I think everybody has to take a chance in order for change to happen. It's uncomfortable. Sometimes you might feel you're the only person in the room. But remember, when it comes to e-twinning, you're not. You have this whole body of people that actually will support you to do this. So do take the chance, because I think it's important that we do change the world the way we want to see it, that we're in control, and not that the technology is controlling us. So i really like to thank everybody for their rapt attention. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Butler. Um, so we're now going to have a quick video address from MEP Maria Walsh, um, which will be on screen. Tia Gwich from the European Parliament here in Brussels. My name is Maria Walsh and I'm an MEP for Ireland's Midlands Northwest constituency. As the only Irish MEP on the Culture and Education Committee here in the Parliament, I am delighted to be able to send you all a message of support during your national conference today. The Culture and Education Committee here in the Parliament is the committee which discusses policy involving education, including spearheading the Erasmus Plus programme and looking at innovative ways in which we can use education to connect EU citizens to each other. E-twinning is a perfect example of an EU platform which exists in order to coordinate, connect and transform education in primary and secondary schools throughout the European Union. In fact, the e-twinning community has been central in connecting learning, critical thinking and contributing to our communities. E-twinning offers Irish teachers the opportunity to learn together, to share resources and ideas and to feel part of the wider European community. Similarly, uh, it gives Irish students the opportunity to learn in an international environment, to connect with other European students and to learn about different European cultures and languages. E-twinning, with its cross-border aspect, is part of the European initiatives in education, based on the claim that EU-wide cooperation supports the development of quality education. The E-Twinning Schools, a special group within the E-Twinning community, consists of more than 3,000 institutions embed uh, with such values in their schools policy, practice and professional development with the support of school management. The free online platform of E-Twinning brings European schools, teachers, students and projects closer together with the potential to connect more than 1 million teachers right across our European Union. 
I believe that eTwinning is a hugely beneficial resource for Irish schools and I would like to take this opportunity to encourage teachers and those working in schools in Ireland to take full advantage of this fantastic opportunity and to utilise the eTwinning platform. With more active users, we can ensure that the future of our education systems are the best they can be. I hope you have an informative, productive and insightful conference and I hope through your work we will see much more engagement in the eTwinning platform in the future. Good luck, enjoy and grow me a market. Hello everyone. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to our panel discussion on digital well-being in education. In an era where technology intertwines with learning, our panel, led by Fiona Foreman, will explore the critical importance of fostering digital well-being in educational settings. Following our discussion, we will have a question and answer round, and we encourage you to ask our panelists some questions. So Fiona Foreman of Outside the Box Learning Resources is an author, speaker, facilitator, and trainer in the areas of well-being and positive psychology. Having spent many years as a primary school teacher, she is passionate about placing well-being at the heart of school life. Joining Fiona in our discussion are our three panelists. Ethna Vikhion, teacher at Klohorenka National School in Kildare. Ethna is an experienced e-twinner, having undertaken projects on well-being, creativity, and cultural diversity. Jane McGarrigal, project officer at Webwise. Webwise promotes the autonomous, effective, and safer use of the internet by young people through a sustained information and awareness strategy targeting parents, teachers, and children. Emma Mason, sixth year student at Sacred Heart Secondary School in Drogheda County Louth. Emma is a member of the Webwise Youth Advisory Panel. So I'll now hand over the mic to Fiona to begin our discussion. Great, <clears throat> thanks so much Ava, delighted to be here. Um, and the theme of today's panel discussion is digital well-being in education. And since the COVID-19 pandemic, this has definitely been a very topical subject. So I'm going to go to each of the panel members to ask in your area of work, what are you currently seeing regarding students' well-being in the wake of the pandemic? And I think I'll go to you first, Ethan, on that as a, as a teacher. Thank you very much. Um, well, really, in looking at well-being, I, as a primary school teacher, have to take the child first. And it has been a great battle of mine over the years in taking the balance between the, the digital learning child or the growing human child. And I think this is definitely something um, in my own school in particular and among the teachers that we've met in, in foreign schools that we've partnershiped with over the years. Finding that balance is extremely difficult. In the, as an outcome of the COVID-19, where we see great skills in relation to using particular apps and programs with technologies, there is that improvement that can be incorporated very simply into classwork. However, it's simply to show or display classwork. So we're still not seeing that innovative use of, I suppose, the problem solving, the creating, the questioning, what they can do with technologies because they don't know how the hows. Um, currently, I must even admit that some of my own colleagues on the younger scale wouldn't know how to power off a computer properly or if there was um, troubleshooting, they genuinely do not know how to figure any of that out. So there is that aspect of it as well from the teacher's point of view that we do need more, I suppose, more training or more opportunities to learn such um, challenging tasks. Because in a classroom environment where our cubes might fall on the floor or a jigsaw puzzle might be missing a piece, if our technologies, if we can't solve a problem in showing a child or even using a technology, then we can't fix it in front of them. We can't solve it. We can't create a new jigsaw piece there in front of them um, because these are the things children look at. This is how they learn. Putting them in front of a screen or with a, a game that they can create or even coding, it, it doesn't give them the, the ooh, or just the inspiration to want to be different, to create something new. So I think in a primary level, that's something we have to look at. And on the well-being side of that, they don't have the resilience. They don't have the initiative and the ability to simply step back, question, or dive in when they need to. Because again, that's, that's the fun of it, you know, really getting the hands dirty, out in the muddy puddle, 
in among the wires or the buttons or the, the devices that actually do something that their brain didn't expect them to. Great, thanks for that, Ethna. And again, I think what I'm hearing there is the idea of the gap, the gaps in the knowledge. I know from as being a former primary school teacher, uh, when I was teaching myself, often if a problem would happen with technology, it would be one of the children that would actually fix it for me Absolutely. because they were knowing more and they had less of a fear. I would have a little bit more of a fear of and touching it. I think that's or, very, yeah. very relevant, um, yeah. especially for um, yeah, the teacher's side of their, mm -hmm. their mental state and their stress mm -hmm. levels and that. But we've always given tools to children yes. for them to solve. Yeah, true. So really, it's, there's something that needs to be worked on. If we have a basic, a basic understanding, even on how to facilitate it, yes. let them be the learners yes. and the discoverers. And, and they love that. And let them be yes. the teachers to yeah, us, because so again, that's something they really yes. enjoy. You yes. have that, those teachers among your class yes. who will be yeah. heads of businesses exactly. or prim principals in school. Yeah. So, but it, it is, it's getting that, that personal strength for them. Mm. Um, the, they're quite, since COVID, I find in my older children, they're very passive. They will sit. I've, I don't think I ever had a mannerly class like I had last yeah. year where they would sit and listen to everything the teacher said. Yeah. Well. But their listening skills were, yes, they would sit and be there. But when it came to actually solving something or, or returning something, they didn't always have it. They would respond in how they expected they thought you were asking them. Right. So then when it came to actual like critical thinking or discussion, they found that very difficult. And where we would always have the more boisterous and the, the ambitious child, they would sit pleasantly, afraid of making mistakes, afraid of um, being maybe on the teachings of being super nice. They didn't want to step on or insult yes. another schoolmate. And like okay. this is happening right down at seven and eight year olds, which yeah. I do find quite disheartening and yeah. must so overcome. Certainly challenges there yeah. since, yeah. Right, and I'm going to ask uh, Jane that same question. So what, what are you seeing as the challenges? So um, I suppose since the pandemic, um, there is definitely a recognition of the important role of digital technology mm -hmm. in young people's lives, a recognition that uh, we need to teach young people uh, digital media literacy skills. Um, but if we look at what the research is telling us and what's going on for children and young people, um, online bullying is still the number one issue affecting children and young people online. Um, so for us over the last couple of years in WebWise and the online safety initiative, um, we felt it was really important to revisit that topic, to look at it, to develop some new resources and supports for teachers in this area. And see the Department of Education launched their Canaltas action plan last year as well. Um, so um, we did consultation groups with educators, um, with our youth panel, um, and um, I suppose came together to develop some new supports to help schools in this area, to, to help schools revisit the area. So we've developed new online courses. These are short, two-hour self-directed courses in understanding, recognising, um, responding and preventing cyberbullying. They can be accessed uh, via the WebWise website. Um, they're a really great course for new teachers, for teachers who want to go back and I suppose um, check in with this topic. The, it looks at the legal framework around bullying, um, the requirements, the roles, the responsibilities of the school, um, scenarios, what to do with dealing with an incident, bringing it into the curriculum. And then to support these courses, so there's primary and post-primary courses. We also launched a new junior cycle unit of learning called the Respect Effect. It aligns to the, the new um, SBHE curriculum. Um, and again, we worked with our youth panel and other teachers to develop this resource. And there's some really up-to-date scenarios there that, that look at prevalent issues for young people. Uh, so things around uh, banter, those subtle forms of bullying, um, identifying and recognising bullying, which young people have told us that, that you know, um, they find it hard to actually recognise when something was upsetting them. It was only after the fact. So there's lessons there to help tease that out and, and building empathy and resilience as well. Um, they're all available on our website. Um, but I suppose we, we regularly talk to our youth panel about what's going on for them mm -hmm. and what they think about mm -hmm. uh, technology and their role worlds and the role technology is playing. Particularly this year, we've seen some big changes. And I suppose I'd like to share some of the things they're telling us and what's concerning them. Um, first of all, young people recognise um, the benefits of technology, that they recognise the important role it plays for them. 
um, they, they see it as a, a tool for good to help solve the big problems, housing, climate change, inequality, those sorts of things. But they also see that it has the potential to bring up problems elsewhere and have concerns around things like their privacy, their rights online, recognising and verifying information um, online. Um, and I suppose that's where our role is to help them build the skills around understanding privacy. Um, and I suppose we have lots of resources to help in that area yeah. as well. That's brilliant. Thanks so much for that, Jane. And that very much ties in with what you were saying, Ethna, in terms of that gap in, in, in the knowledge that those resources are there, are there for teachers to use. And again, it's, it's just, I always find it so shocking that bullying is still an issue. Yeah. You know, after my 30 odd years of teaching, we're still talking about it. I, I, I mean, hopefully there, we'll find some breakthrough way. Maybe it will be through technology or whatever that we we'll finally crack On that. that. As well. and I think there, there's possibly even an increase in it online because it's been so well looked after and managed within the schools. Mm, but even yes. at that, it's like they learn the skills off, but they don't use them use and them. having to apply them. Yes. And that can only come through social yeah. interactions. Yes, true. Face to face, actual mm, like true. group bonding, yes. building. Empathy. Uh, empathy, all yeah. collaborative work. Yeah. And it can be difficult to do online, mm. but that's somewhere like where the e-twinning platform has been really beneficial because Brilliant. it's pupils, we've worked pupils through, throughout Europe, where they're actually, they think they have the same problems, but when they meet, they, they realise they're all very similar Good. and they can, they can just trash things out and work on them that way. Somewhere. Yeah, but it is finding opportunities to, yeah. to practice and to develop yes. the skills properly. Skills, yeah. And same question to you, Emma. What are you seeing as a, as a student? I suppose you're there in the thick of it. You were saying earlier that you were in second year uh, when the schools closed for the first time and you didn't get to do your junior cert. So you really have been impacted um, by um, the pandemic. And what, what are you seeing as a result of that with, with your peers as well? You can see a big generation gap in my age anyway. I know... I have a big knowledge on technology because my dad influenced me when I was younger. So I grew up knowing how to use a laptop, how to use my phone, how to download apps. But I can see some of my peers wouldn't know how to open like Microsoft 365. They'd have to ask me, how do I use Canva? How do I save this to my laptop? And it's, we can't be educated on it because we would be the most knowledgeable on how to use it. So we have teachers coming to us asking us, is this okay? Is that right? We have prefects in our school for IT diversity to help teachers understand where students are coming from and I think that's a big point in teachers like accepting that we need young people's help in getting to a good point because the only people that really know what young people need is young people there's so much that <laughs> adults can do looking at what we're going through without hearing our voices there's not much mm. and I know I joined the youth panel to hear other people other people my age's opinions because there's only so much I would know coming from an all girls school I would not know any like any lads point of views on what they go through online so I wanted to join the youth panel so I could hear everyone's perspective so I could have an open mind when I'm going to my school and saying these are the issues we are going through I wanted to be able to say okay women might be going through different issues than men but there's also issues that is affecting everyone like online bullying and sexual harassment online we hear one part of it but the youth panel has really given me the opportunity to be able to hear amazing point of views. And I've been, my mind has been open. This is only my second year on the panel. And I have become so informed on the different things that is wrong with the internet. <laughs> I used to love being online. I was like, I was very oblivious to what was going wrong online. Mm -hmm. And I'd sit online for hours and be like, this is great. And now when I went on the youth panel, I was like, okay, <laughs> I need to learn how to control my digital well-being because... I'm going to grow up addicted and I'm going to grow up relying on technology to be able to live my life and to a point I think we all do because it's the only way we know about these conferences and be able to develop in the real world but it's a good yeah. separation it's a, of learning. It's a lot. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a lot. And again, the speed of change, I think Deirdre talked about that this morning, the speed of change, I think, yeah. uh, is just massive. I don't think we've ever seen that in education, that the change, the, the speed of it so much can be very overwhelming for both teachers and students. So to try and navigate that is, is very hard. So we do need uh, much as resources and support as much as possible. But I suppose if anything good came out of the pandemic, it was the idea that education uh, did become more innovative. Uh, and again, Deirdre, 
spoke this morning about how, you know, people were maybe forced, and I was one of those people myself, uh, forced onto the online space. Um, because again, you might be afraid to, to try stuff out, and then when you're forced to, you actually have to. So again, what, what did you see in your own work? Um, I'll, go, I'll go to you first, Jeffna, there, um, in terms I'm, of the innovation. I'm going to be a little bit of a naysayer on the online life now, just, just for devil's advocate, um, in relation to especially younger people. But the, uh, I'm all for the wonderful technologies and yes. developments, especially yeah. on an education field in relation to spell checking, C pens, mm. best invention in the world. Um, the, the tools that can enable children who might have learning difficulties, but these amazing mm. intelligence that haven't been able to be unlocked before. Yeah. So in being able to apply skill, um, opportunities to them, for them to develop the skills. Again, it doesn't need to come back 100% fold on the teacher, it's facilitating. However, these children then are become, are they're meeting up on pars on an educational level. And here is where my biggest issue is, the social level, the ability to actually communicate with each other. And there, I, like, I just have envisioned these things for the future where that's on one language. Mm. I, would, I would struggle to see how they're going to um, initiate conversations or discussions or um, communicate with people from different cultures and different languages where they find it difficult to interpret each other's language as is. So finding that, you incorporating things within the school now with us, we're much more, um, we've got committees for everything with the children yes. now, where we would have simply had the older children might look after the younger children for eight time, they'd play with them, whatever. We now have set up structured committees for well-being, um, buddy group systems, we have an Irish committee, student council, all of these structured groups. So as we can bring children together, giving them a voice, but also <coughs> offering them opportunities to use that voice, to use their own personalities and their own beliefs and have them simply monitored by a staff member. Um, we participate very little in them. We simply take minutes or whatever, <laughs> but we can be there as a guide when needs be. And I think these particular innovations have been wonderful um, these have been again we've worked on these with our colleagues in partner schools and we've all found that the the independence in the children is improving greatly through this also their their respect for each other as individuals and not just like school children um, we still have a difficulty where there is some there's still a fear of parents of certain teachers and you know parent teacher meetings coming up and the dread of this and the dread of that I do see that has improved Possibly through the more communication we may have had online Gosh. during COVID. And then there's been a continued uh, level of more regular messaging. But it is very difficult on a teacher for that. I mean, the parents still expect that high level of, of texts or emails or whatever. So again, that is something mm. to be looked at. In relation to the children then as well, we've really had to focus on all elements of children, child's well-being, from their, their active learning to emotional um, and their, of course, their, their eating and their, their lifestyle, their um, healthy eating, well-being as well. So setting up programs within the school and working with programs by, by the EU have been really, really good for us. Um, we've used food dudes. Webwise is just something I would absolutely swear by. I thought since it came out originally, I think um, these are fantastic initiatives as well. And we're making sure that they're their core parts of our, our learning in our Brilliant. school. And again, empowering, that's what came up for me when you were talking there, and I know Deirdre talked about that this morning, about the whole idea of, of digital well-being is about empowering children, and you're very much doing that. So again, to, to use it for the positives is so yes. important, isn't it? And Emma, how would you see that in terms of the, the positives, I suppose, or the innovation that has maybe come in especially, in the last few years? Especially in schools that were running pre-technology, like advances, I know, we, in my school, we were, we've been running since like 1960. So we did not have laptops or iPads until maybe 10 years ago. Okay. So I joined and we only used laptops maybe once or twice a week. Mm -hmm. And that would only be in second year when we were doing classroom-based assessments or in TY when we were doing projects online every single day. We would not use laptops or iPads or phones and for a second, first or third year, 100%. And not, I wouldn't know, but... I'd imagine not in leaving there either. But we when we came went through COVID, we obviously moved online and we had to learn how to use Microsoft 365 and how to use Teams and how to do projects online and how to do independent research was the most important thing for me because 
we were just being told what to learn when we were in school before COVID. We were being given a book and we were given notes and you say, okay, study that. If you want to, if you were given like a research project, you really didn't know what to do pre-COVID. You kind of just Google it, write it down. That was it. And then when we went back from COVID, we saw a massive shift in how our school was running. We were using laptops every single class, iPads every single class. All our homework was online. We had to submit it. It wasn't just hand a piece of paper to teacher anymore. And you'd be doing research projects in class as a part of the curriculum. So you'd be having the chance to learn how to do independent study, which I think is important yes. for going on to college. Yes. Because obviously your, your teacher's not going to be yes. sat in there holding your hand, telling you, OK, your homework is done this day. <laughs> Hand it up to me this day. No, when you're in college, you will be told, hand it in that day. It's all independent. You'll be doing it yourself. And that's what school's preparing me for now. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't before. Right. We yeah. were just like writing on yeah. paper. And now it's great because I see the younger years are learning how to use laptops in first year. Mm -hmm. And honestly, we learned in TY. So the fact we now are letting the first years and second years like learn technology and develop that is going to be great for their futures. Yes. Because they're not going to go into college and be like, oh, my God, yeah. what is this? Shock. Why do I have to go to a library, get a book, study myself? The teacher's not telling me what my project is on. <laughs> this is going to be a madman, like a mad show. It's honestly the, only, the one good thing that came out of the pandemic is that the development in yes. technology in schools, yes. especially schools, I know. There's a new school near me and it opened after COVID and they are all about technology. That's all online. They went into school knowing how to use technology. Mm -hmm. Schools that opened beforehand did not. So it's, we're developing and it's honestly. And a steep learning curve is not yeah. what it was for all of us that we might never, it wouldn't have been that steep. Certainly not for me anyway. I would have been reluctant to embrace it all, but we all had to. And, and the good that came out of that, as you said, so that is brilliant. And uh, Jane, would you find the same? Yeah, so I suppose, uh, why is it part of um, IJA, the new school support service? Right. Formerly, we were part of PDST yes. and technology and education. So our colleagues were kind of at the forefront of yeah. supporting of everyone to try and get yes. online and get to grips with remote learning um, and all that. And, you know, schools can still access face-to-face uh, -face supports in terms of digital technologies and good practice and online courses, there's lots of good stuff there. In terms of our, ourselves, it was a good opportunity to reflect and say, do you know, I, I just mentioned we have loads of resources there and they're great. Uh, they're not very good if the teachers don't feel comfortable mm -hmm. using them in the classroom or don't feel like they have a good enough understanding of what digital citizenship is or anything like that. So. Um, you know, we, we had to do something to address that gap. Um, and, and you mentioned it yourself, um, you know, sometimes teachers feel like the kids know more mm. than they do. So one of the things we developed was an online course, um, an introduction to digital citizenship. Um, so the, the kind of first half of it, there's primary and post-primary uh, available, um, and they're all free to access through the IJA Technology in Education website or our own website. And the, it kind of unpacks the concept of digital citizenship and breaks it down into different themes, different topics, gives explainers on each what those themes mean, ethics, well-being, respectful communication, um, commerce online, all those areas are kind of explained so that the educator gets an idea of what that topic is. I understand that topic, what that means in the classroom and then looks at the practical application and how we might embed digital citizenship across the classroom. So that's one of the things. I don't think we can talk about innovation without talking about AI as well. Mm, and Deirdre mentioned yes. it. Um, yes. And look, that document she highlighted, the ethical uh, EU document is a really good document. Um, we This is an area we're looking at. It's, it's a big area. The generative AI thing has you know, exploded last year. So we are looking at the practical implications for educators and for school leaders and are developing, um, I suppose, considerations for ethical use of AI in the classroom, in school, implications for school policy, and there will be supports and guidance available to schools shortly through our website as well. So um, there's there's more stuff coming there. Brilliant, because the speed of that is just mind blowing mm -hmm. with the AI. You know, one minute it was just out there, seemed kind of, you know, way in the distance, and now all of a sudden it is in education. So I need to catch up on that myself, definitely. Um, and in terms of e-twinning, Ethna, how can that um, help with pupil uh, well-being and digital well-being? Just on a classroom perspective, uh, the, the 
the platform on each winning, which has grown tremendously in the last, I, I, I think my first login or registration was probably about 2006. Our internet was so poor in the school, we were one of five percent where every image had a red X on my one. And I had to very quickly figure out that, oh, if I right click, I can go into some US something code, blah, 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 made it all up as I went along. And I was able to access things. It did make it very difficult for me at the time to upload information that we were sharing with Iceland at the time. But now the platform is so much more uh, teacher and pupil friendly. Still not 100% there, but I, I can't believe the difference in it. Um, we are, all of our children in school have, uh, you mentioned Microsoft, we use Google. So all of our children have Google accounts. From It was from junior infants during COVID, but it's now simply from first class up. So they have their own access codes to get into the Chromebooks and, and tablets and that if they wish to share information. So through e-twinning then, um, because we have our own school domain, the children's um, accounts are locked between themselves. You know, they, they don't have access to the outside world for Gmail and so on. But it also means that with that domain, we can, we could, we haven't ventured this far yet, we could give pupils access on the e-twinning platform where they could independently communicate with, with peers in partner schools, which would be absolutely fantastic. Now, we do have big concerns over the, the safety or the, um, the inclusion, really, because we're still in an area where internet is not fully accessible to children. Um, we, so you're given homework to most of the class, but some don't have it done. And I would be very conscious of how that can make a child feel. So I tend not to give it at all. It's an option. Everything in my classroom is optional. They can choose whether to hand homework up digitally or on paper.